sudah ini uh, Fatma Fikri udah ready ya? Ya Pak sudah live juga. Sudah Pak sudah. Live YouTube sudah on Pak. Oke okay, sudah di on ya. Ya baik selamat pagi teman-teman bapak-bapak ibu-ibu selamat malam buat Celia di Amerika. Uh, perkenalkan kalau yang belum kenal uh, nama saya Fajar Ibnu Tufail. Saya peneliti di Pusat Penelitian Kewilayahan di LIPI, Lembaga Ilmu Pengetahuan Indonesia. Dan pagi ini saya e, bertindak sebagai host untuk acara e, diskusi Area Escape e, volume yang kelima. Jadi e, sebelum kita perkenalkan tamu kita pagi ini, e, saya akan sedikit memberikan pengantar e, tentang apa itu area scape, barangkali ada beberapa teman-teman yang baru bergabung kali ini, jadi belum tahu uh, apa itu area scape. Jadi area scape ini adalah salah satu forum yang dikelola oleh Pusat Penelitian Kewilayahan di LIPI, uh, dikelola secara online, dan tujuannya adalah untuk ke, sebagai forum untuk berdiskusi tentang hal-hal yang terkait dengan kajian wilayah atau area studies, khususnya tentang teori, metode, maupun hasil-hasil penelitian yang terkait dengan area studies. Area studies di sini didefinisikan secara umum. ya. Nah, area scape ini yang pagi ini adalah yang kelima, seperti tadi sudah saya sampaikan. Sebelumnya kita sudah memulai area escape ini pada beberapa minggu yang lalu dan kita harapkan akan berlanjut sampai nanti, tidak tahu sampai kapan. Tapi kita usahakan agar forum ini tetap reguler dan bisa ditayangkan mudah-mudahan seminggu sekali. Jadi uh, untuk area escape ini uh, kami tidak membatasi topik karena area studies uh, mencakup banyak hal, tetapi semua yang terkait dengan kajian-kajian yang 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 disebut area studies, kajian wilayah yang bisa masuk ke dalam kotak itu kita wajahi dalam dalam uh, area escape ini dan kebetulan karena di pusat penelitian kewilayahan ini terdiri dari berbagai macam konsentrasi kajian, ada yang dari uh, untuk Afrika Studies, ada European Studies, ada juga uh, Southeast Asian Studies, dan ada Japanese Studies. Jadi kita akan uh, mencoba untuk berusaha untuk mengcover semuanya, meskipun ini uh, agak sulit ya, uh, untuk mencari pembicara yang terkait dengan hal-hal uh, terkait dengan wilayah yang di luar Southeast Asia dan, dan uh, Indonesia. Dan satu hal lagi yang saya ingin sampaikan bahwa area studies, area scape ini kita adakan khusus karena kita berpikir bahwa banyak teman-teman di luar Indonesia yang melakukan kajian tentang Indonesia, tetapi jarang mendapat kesempatan untuk berinteraksi atau untuk menyampaikan sharing hasil penelitiannya dengan kawan-kawan di Indonesia. Dengan adanya forum online seperti ini, yang bisa menjangkau teman-teman uh, dari seluruh pelosok penjuru tanah air. Jadi saya pikir salah satu uh, ada ada baiknya buat buat uh, kami di Lipi untuk menyediakan forum semacam ini agar ada semacam uh, tukar pikiran atau sharing uh, bagi teman-teman yang yang melakukan penelitian Indonesia tetapi tinggal di luar negeri dengan teman-teman yang ada di Indonesia. Jadi uh, latar berpikirnya area area escape itu adalah uh, seperti itu. Nah, uh, uh, pagi ini uh, kita mendapat kesempatan yang 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 luar biasa uh, bisa bertemu dengan uh, Profesor Celia Lo. Uh, beliau adalah antropolog. Uh, sekarang uh, mengajar di uh, University of Washington di Seattle di Amerika Serikat. Mbak Celia ini kawan baik saya sudah lama sekali meneliti tentang Indonesia sudah hampir sekitar 30 tahun 
dan sudah menghasilkan uh, berbagai karya tulis tentang Indonesia, khususnya di, di bidang uh, environmental studies dan uh, anthropology of science. Uh, buku pertama beliau uh, judulnya Wild uh, Profusions uh, tentang biodiversity dan conservation di Indonesia. Dan sekarang uh, beliau sedang uh, melakukan penelitian dan mempersiapkan sebuah buku khusus tentang uh, flu burung atau avian flu. Ya, mudah-mudahan dalam waktu dekat bukunya akan segera keluar. Tetapi uh, Mbak Celia ini sudah banyak juga menulis tentang uh, topik uh, avian flu itu di berbagai jurnal yang 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 sudah diterbitkan. Uh, seperti misalnya di culture anthropology, di environmental and uh, humanism dan lain sebagainya. Uh, sebelumnya saya akan menyapa Celia. Selamat malam Celia. Oh, selamat pagi semuanya. Terima kasih. Terima. Saya, ya, saya terima kasih saya diundang untuk ngobrol. Uh, ya, yeah, to chat about my research. Terima kasih banyak. Ya, saya juga terima kasih sudah bersedia. Saya tahu uh, Celia sibuk sekali. Uh, sekarang terutama uh, Celia ini sekarang juga uh, menjabat sebagai uh, Direktur Pusat Kajian Asia Tenggara ya, Celia ya, di University of Seattle ya. Yes. Uh, ya, jadi yes. sibuk sibuk sekali pasti ini. Not, jadi, not terima kasih. Ya, yeah, not too busy for this. <laughs> ya, terima kasih banyak Celia atas kesediaannya uh, uh, berbincang-bincang dengan kami. Oke, okay, uh, teman-teman semua, jadi uh, area studies ini formatnya uh, sedikit berbeda. Jadi kita berusaha um, memberikan format yang lebih interaktif ya. Uh, jadi tidak tidak akan melakukan presentasi dan Q&A, tetapi lebih pada format yang sifatnya ke percakapan atau perbincangan atau conservation uh, con, uh, uh, ke apa namanya conservation lagi. Uh, conversations. Jadi kita uh, akan berbincang selama kurang saya dengan uh, Celia akan berbincang selama kurang lebih 45 menit dan nanti setelah itu kita akan buka uh, kesempatan buat bapak-bapak, ibu-ibu, kawan-kawan semua untuk uh, turut serta dalam perbincangan. Uh, bisa dalam bentuk pertanyaan, bisa dalam bentuk komentar dan lain sebagainya. Nah untuk Kali ini kami uh, akan uh, mute semua uh, mikrofon. Uh, nanti uh, pada saat uh, perbincangan saya berdiskusi dengan Celia, kalau ada misalnya ada yang ingin bertanya atau ingin ikut serta dalam perbincangan di uh, bagian kedua, uh, silakan uh, tulis nama di kolom chat. Jadi nanti akan saya berikan kesempatan satu demi satu dan saya akan buka akses uh, mikrofon pada saat nanti uh, giliran masing-masing tiba. Jadi saya rasa uh, pengantar dari saya sekian dulu, dan nanti uh, kita akan mulai dengan perbincangan dengan uh, Celia. Baik Celia, uh, tentunya satu hal yang menarik teman-teman di forum ini tahu adalah tentang judul uh, diskusi kita pagi ini yaitu etnografi of viruses. Nah ini buat teman-teman yang eh, baik itu antropolog maupun non antropolog pasti akan bertanya-tanya. Yang namanya etnografi itu biasanya urusannya dengan orang atau dengan kelompok etnis. Dan tapi ini kok etnografi berurusan dengan virus. Nah ini kan sesuatu yang buat teman-teman barangkali langsung bertanya-tanya apa urusannya antropolog yang biasa mengurusi budaya upacara perkawinan ritual terus kekerabatan kinship apa urusan antropolog dengan virus dan biasanya kalau kita bicara virus tentu kita akan bicara penyakit nah memang betul ada yang di salah satu cabang di antropologi yang disebut sebagai medical antropologi 
atau antropologi kesehatan. Tetapi kalau menurut saya penelitian atau karya-karya Celia selama ini mungkin kurang kurang pas kalau diletakkan dalam kerangka atau dalam 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 kategori medical antropologi. Saya mungkin salah. Tetapi uh, saya ingin uh, pendapat Celia tentang hal ini dan dan pendapat Celia tentang uh, apa memang betul ada bedanya antara yang uh, Celia kerjakan sekarang dengan uh, proyek-proyek atau penelitian penelitian di bidang uh, antropologi kesehatan. Silakan Celia. Oke, okay. thank you so much for your question. Uh, yes, that's that's a good one. If I'm studying uh, viruses, why is my work not medical anthropology, not considered part of medical anthropology? Um, it's true. I do not consider myself a medical anthropologist. Um, some people might call me that, but that's not how I think about myself. Um, when I think about medical anthropology, Uh, I think about the experiences and life worlds of patients and practitioners. Um, medical anthropologists are interested in the experiences of sickness and healing, whether from a biomedical perspective, because anthropologists now also study the experiences of biomedicine, Um, or from some alternative or traditional form of healing or experience. Um, th they're primarily interested in the pluralism of medical, uh, medical systems. Um, <clears throat> so I myself, when I study viruses, am not uh, primarily focused on the experiences of patients um, or the practices of healing. Um, instead, so my work on viruses, I would say, comes from a very different place and a very different set of interests. Um, my work on viruses actually stems from my work in uh, anthropology of the environment or um, political ecology or environmental justice, um, where I was interested in um, the experiences of conservation biologists, both Indonesian and uh, foreign, maybe British or American, uh, working in a place called the Togian Islands, which is in Teluk Tomini in uh, Sulawesi Tengah. Um, and uh, there I was interested in what kinds of scientific questions were being asked. Um, my perspective was from something called science and technology studies um, rather than environmental anthropology uh, specifically. Um, and what I concluded, which is what many people studying the natural sciences conclude, is that uh, the questions you asked have something to do with who you are. That's different from how we think about science, where we think about Uh, science coming first from nature, right? We're trying to study some natural phenomenon and the question itself must be natural. So I don't believe that. I believe that uh, questions come from humans who are situated inside of particular communities and uh, the interests we have as humans depend upon uh, those social connections and communities. Um, so as, a, as a, an anthropologist studying uh, environmental issues, I became very interested in the H5N1 outbreak uh, beginning in, uh, it first came to Indonesia in 2003. Um, and I, so I had very similar questions to the ones that I had when I was um, Uh, examining, looking at, studying conservation biology and its practices in the Togian Islands. Uh, um, so what would be an ethnographic approach to viruses? Um, I, I was interested in what many people call assemblages. How do different uh, things come together, different practices, different events, Uh, different interests that people have come together around a particular problem. Um, 
this kind of work always has a problem at the center. It's not uh, simply uh, how do people heal in a given context, but rather um, uh, what kind of problem is the virus and who is it a problem for? And um, in what ways is it taken up in different communities? So with H5N1, um, I was interested in how the virus was taken up, uh, for example, by um, uh, bird collectors in Jogjakarta. I'm sure all of you know that birds are very important to, uh, uh, to collectors there. And so how did they think about these birds? Were the birds going to um, uh, bring the H5N1 virus into their homes? Should they um, uh, uh, eradicate the, these birds uh, that were so precious to them or not? Um, I worked with, uh, we ha I have a colleague here, uh, uh, Didi Indrawan, who is a very well-known uh, uh, bird biologist in Indonesia, and I was fortunate to be able to um, go along with him to look at some of the work that he and his colleagues were doing, um, uh, looking at wild birds uh, and um, how, uh, whether or not wild birds were carrying this virus into Indonesia. Um, I was interested in uh, the interactions between Indonesia and the United States, where the United States was pushing a kind of um, pandemic preparedness agenda. So I was interested in how was the U.S. Agency for International Development pushing this particular agenda? So these are all different components. Um, anywhere I could find a community that was interacting with, that had the virus at the center of it, whether it was bird watchers, bird keepers, uh, virologists, um, public health uh, officials, I would put these uh, experiences together to form some kind of picture of, of the problem and, uh, and how it, how it uh, came to, uh, um, how, it inter how it connected lives um, and how it rearranged relationships. Um, one question I always have is, what is new in the practices I'm looking at? So in the Togian Islands, there was the creation of a new national park. Um, in the, the uh, H5N1 outbreak, there was the, the creation of new institutions, uh, um, new uh, ways of behaving or acting inside of institutions, uh, um, uh, new, just uh, things that were, were new, um, new emergences um, around the virus. So, so I guess that's when I think of my work as an anthropologist, I think um, that, that, that that's really what I'm doing, is looking at how a particular um, object, animal, virus, plant, uh, uh, institution, how they bring uh, people together to form new new forms of sociality. So so that's that's I think a long version of why I don't consider myself a medical anthropologist, but why I think uh, a virus uh, or viral ethnography is really relevant to new forms of doing anthropology. Baik, terima kasih Celia. Penjelasan yang sangat uh, komprehensif dan ini langsung me membuka sebuah uh, apa namanya uh, pertanyaan lebih lanjut tentang tentang sebuah uh, apa namanya uh, isu yang penting tapi sebelumnya saya ingin tanya uh, uh, Fikri Farma suara saya lihat terdengar nggak terdengar jelas Pak dengar bagus ya iya bagus jadi nggak nggak ada yang masalah ya teman-teman uh, juga dengar semua ya Jelas, Pak. Kelihatannya jelas, sama Pak. jelas ya. ya. Oke, okay. terima kasih. Ini berarti bukan kesalahannya, bukan di di siaran sini. Oke, okay. baik. Uh, jadi kembali ke uh, penjelasan saya lihat tadi. Uh, satu hal yang langsung uh, muncul dalam penjelasan saya lihat tadi adalah satu konsep yang yang sering dipakai tidak hanya oleh uh, saya lihat, tetapi juga uh, banyak oleh antropologis of science ya 
uh, yaitu konsep yang disebut uh, multi species dan juga terkait dengan hal itu juga uh, adalah animal animal companion ini yang uh, pertama kali kalau tidak salah uh, Dona Harawe yang mengukakan konsep ini nah uh, mungkin Celia bisa sedikit menjelaskan atau menguraikan bagaimana memanfaatkan tadi memang sudah disebutkan secara singkat tetapi barangkali uh, lebih bisa di Uh, uraikan lebih jauh tentang apa sebenarnya yang disebut dengan animal companion ini dalam uh, penelitian Celia dan kemudian uh, kaitannya dengan uh, multispecies relation itu seperti apa karena uh, barangkali kalau bicara multispecies kita akan uh, satu hal yang muncul dalam pikiran kita adalah uh, biodiversity apakah sama uh, multispecies dengan biodiversity ini Silakan, Celia. Thank you. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, no, I don't think they're precisely the same um, because they're designed to solve different problems. Um, biodiversity uh, is a term that was coined in the mid 1980s um, to uh, solve the problem of or to describe the problem of declining numbers of species uh, on the planet. So species loss. Uh, biodiversity really um, referred to that problem. So words always refer back to particular problems. Um, multi-species ethnography is, uh, the word multi-species, I would say, points to a slightly different problem, which is um, really the problem of um, flourishing on and on a planet that has experienced such uh, both social and natural losses. So um, uh, to speak about the natural world, uh, biodiversity loss um, uh, is, is an example of the way um, our lives are, um, I'm trying to think of the opposite of enriched. Our, our lives are not enriched when we lose uh, species. Um, uh, our lives are not enriched through um, pollution, through climate change, through all different kinds of environmental degradation. Um, we, we lose uh, the ability to live uh, lives worth living on this planet as it becomes more environmentally degraded. Um, uh, and one of the, so the problem that multi-species is pointing to is the idea that we share this biosphere with other creatures. And in order to flourish, in order to do well, we need to be doing well with all of these creatures. Um, and this, you know, this can be sort of controversial because we're used to thinking of things in human-centric terms. And sometimes we imagine that the world has too many human problems to worry about any kind of animal problems. Um, but what uh, other creatures can do is show us how we are interconnected um, and we can't really um, survive and flourish without um, um, a beneficial uh, environment for all of us. So, um, the term companion species, uh, yes, comes from Donna Haraway, her book, uh, The Companion Species Manifesto. So as a manifesto, right, that's different than an ethnography. It's a strong statement position. Um, and what she writes is that species are engaged with in co-productions with humans. Um, we, what co-productions means is that we are making things together. We are making worlds together. So how can we make worlds where we all flourish together? And you can ask this question from a multi-species perspective. <clears throat> you can also ask this from an inter-human perspective. What does it take for, um, you, you know, right now in the United States, we're having uh, uh, protests over racism. Well, what does it take to e eliminate, eradicate that those forms of racism, forms of white privilege that 
uh, I have witnessed in looking at Indonesian conservation biology, for example, with foreign biologists working in, in Indonesia. So how do we flourish together? Um, and the emphasis on companion species <clears throat> and uh, multi-species ethnography really it says that we, we actually can't do this. Um, we can't flourish alone without the creatures that we're attached to. So I'll give you an example. Um, and an example from my research on uh, H5N1 avian influenza, and that is the chicken. So, um, <coughs> excuse me, the chicken uh, is, has, lives, lives and has lived many different kinds of lives. Um, there are the uh, I am kampung, which roam freely, eat bugs and grubs and things they find uh, around the yard. Um, there are industrial chickens uh, that live in <clears throat> big giant warehouses with hundreds of thousands of chickens in one warehouse. So what's the difference between these forms of life and why does it matter to us as humans? Well, it turns out that the way we get a virulent, deadly influenza is by putting <coughs> hundreds of thousands of immunocom immunocompromised, uh, perhaps de-beaked, uh, suffering poultry together in a hen house where viruses, the viruses they have, can evolve deadly properties. So we would not have H5N1 independent of industrial poultry processing <clears throat> and production. So we have chickens who are, who are miserable, right? Um, nobody wants that, that karma, right? And we have people who potentially could have died in a global influenza pandemic because of the way we are processing chickens. Um, so that's really an example. We've got, uh, in, in that case, we've got the virus. We've got <clears throat> several different kinds of human beings. We have different chicken lives. Um, and, and we're looking at those all together um, uh, to uh, uh, see really what, what takes place, what new things emerge, what transforms. Um, how relations are rearranged amongst people, animals, even plants, and also objects in the process. So, um, so that's an example from the chicken. You know, why I would need to include <coughs> the chicken, knowledge of the chicken, right? It's not just I'm including these as objects, but I'm researching them. I had to learn about the virus, how it evolves uh, in confined animal feeding operations. I had to learn um, about, uh, I had to learn about viral evolution. So really, um, you know, you're bringing in all of these different, uh, species entities and their experiences, uh, and their biologies together to understand this, uh, new configuration of rearranged relations that in the end, uh, did not produce a pandemic in that case. Um, but we, we will see when we get to coronavirus how, um, how a, a human pandemic emerged under sim similar conditions. Um, so we really need to know about all these. We need to know about all of us together and we need to flourish together in order to, uh, in order to really understand a particular problem like an influenza virus. Yeah. Uh... Ini sebenarnya kemudian uh, menjadi salah satu bahasan yang sangat sangat sentral, sangat penting dalam uh, studi tentang uh, STS uh, approach dan kajian sains dan teknologi, terutama dengan uh, pandangan dari Bruno Latour yang memasukkan unsur non-human dalam dalam relasi uh, atau dalam net network. Uh, Uh, actor network theory dan dan dalam konteks uh, kajian yang dilakukan uh, oleh Celia 
kita bisa melihat bagaimana non human itu mengambil bentuk sebagai dalam dalam bentuk ke animal companion atau atau lebih khususnya lagi uh, uh, ayam. Nah, tapi ini satu hal yang yang menarik kalau kita tarik lebih jauh lagi pandangan tentang uh, bahwa uh, kenyataan bahwa kita harus living together dan 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 uh, being together dengan dan non human species ini entah itu adalah human uh, uh, burung burung ayam atau gajah atau virus nah satu hal yang muncul dan mengemuka di dalam konteks ini adalah persoalan bagaimana bentuk relasi itu sendiri nah dalam hal ini kita bicara tentang soal ethics dan Celia juga pernah uh, menulis lebih khusus lagi tentang yang disebut dengan uh, ethics of caring nah Uh, ini salah satu hal yang menurut saya penting dikemukakan juga uh, karena uh, seolah-olah kalau kita berurusan dengan yang disebut dengan non-human species uh, caring itu sesuatu hal yang 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 seringkali uh, dianggap sesuatu yang nomor dua ya kembali lagi kepada pandangan bahwa antroposentrism bahwa manusia itu adalah yang terpenting gitu. Nah, eh, tentang hal ini apakah Celia bisa memberikan sedikit eh, elaborasi tentang bagaimana sebenarnya kalau kita bicara tentang bentuk hubungan relasi antara human dan dan eh, dengan non-human khususnya dalam dalam dimensi ethical ya. Silakan Celia. Well, that that's a difficult question um, that you've asked. Um, Uh, huh. um, now, I think what, what I've been interested in, uh, you also mentioned the word care, um, and, uh, and relate, care, relations, and ethics. Um, so what I've been interested in is how relations get uh, formed, made, and rearranged. Um, Uh, so, uh, and uh, I've been interested in the term care specifically in contradistinction with the term justice. Now, I definitely care about justice. I've cared about environmental justice. I care about uh, uh, the inequalities uh, in uh, health and health care. Um, But to me, the term care adds a dimension to thinking about uh, justice. Um, some have, have declared that justice is a more um, masculine framework of right and wrong, um, whereas care is something that uh, we can see all humans needing and all animals and other creatures needing uh, throughout the life cycle. Um, we need care when we're young. We need care when we're very old. Uh, we need care in between as um, I did work on the uh, elephant endotheliotropic herpes virus or EEHV. And uh, that was really looking at um, how elephants were cared for and what, um, how the nature of that care, the quality of that care um, uh, did or did not have something to do with uh, whether or not the elephant succumbed to this particular disease. Um, so uh, uh, um, I think justice and care are both ethical norms uh, and configurations. Um, but for me, I've been more interested in the, the feminist concept of care uh, than the more masculinist concept of justice, uh, even though I also would say I care about environmental justice and social justice and, mm. and those issues. Um, uh, yeah, so that might be all I have to say on that topic right now. Ya, tapi ada satu hal yang yang uh, sebenarnya menarik juga bahwa di dalam salah, salah satu tulisan Celia mengatakan bahwa yang namanya uh, caring itu tidak selalu akan menghasilkan sesuatu yang 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 uh, 
yang justice gitu. Artinya dalam konteks uh, beberapa lokasi yang berbeda, misalnya dalam uh, kebun binatang di Seattle, terus kemudian di Zurich dan dan di India yang menjadi uh, topik kajian uh, Celia, mereka uh, pengelola dan kemudian uh, uh, dokter hewan di sana uh, semuanya punya konsep yang sama tentang care, tapi dia kemudian menghasilkan sesuatu yang yang berbeda sama sekali. Ya. Artinya bahwa uh, belum tentu caring itu kemudian uh, mengarah kepada atau menghasilkan sebuah konsep justice yang 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 bisa diterima oleh oleh uh, animal itu sendiri. Barangkali uh, saya salah, tapi mungkin uh, se pengetahuan saya dari interpretasi saya terhadap tulisan Celia adalah seperti itu. Apakah betul begitu, Celia? Yeah, I, I think so, absolutely. Um, the example of the Woodland Park Zoo in, in Seattle is a really, um, a really sad one, I would say. Um, the keepers of the elephants uh, here, actually it's right across the street from where I live, um, uh, they they care you could say they cared very much um when a baby elephant that had been in their care for seven years died uh, uh you could see them on television with tears coming down their face and you could see the emotion the sadness of the death of this baby elephant um but but at the same time when you look at what it took to um create that baby elephant the mother of the elephant was sent off to a, um, a different park in the Midwest to be inseminated. She had a hundred different experiences of insemination and uh, she and the baby were, were that, that zoo was even um, uh, sanctioned um, for uh, its treatment of the elephants. The elephants had been beaten. Um, you know, the elephants here that were cared about so deeply that people were crying, lived in one square mile of space for their whole life. It was cold. Uh, it's too cold here in Seattle for them to really thrive. Um, and you could see them doing what's called stereotypic behavior. I'm sure everyone's seen it in a zoo where they sway back and forth like this, right? They sway and sway and it's, you know, their, their muscles, they really have nothing to do with their bodies. Um, elephants can walk tens of miles in a day. And uh, so, so love, love in this case did not really translate into um, uh, care. Rather, in this case, I think it was the, the sort of sense of best scientific practices right, were what would create sufficient care for these elephants. And it turned out to, to not be the case because the, the baby died of the, the herpes virus anyway. Um, you know, so in Zurich, it's a, it's a very different situation. It's a much, much bigger enclosure. Um, there's all kinds of uh, activities for the elephants to do. Um, uh, the elephants can swim in a pool, they, um, they get them walking great distances every day, um, and uh, it's, it's, it's really much more um, thoughtful about the elephants, and yet still they've had elephants die of this disease, which, which is, uh, it's a herpes virus, it's, it's like people get, uh, it's like the human herpes virus, where sometimes it comes out when, when, uh, um, you're under stress. So when the elephants are under stress, this virus can come out and it can kill very quickly in uh, less than a day. Um, you can go from perfectly healthy to having a dead elephant. Um, uh, and in the wild lands of Wayadnad uh, National Park in South India, um, uh, I should also make a point that I did this work uh, with my colleague Ursula Munster um, from the University of Munich, um, and this was her research in South India. Um, she worked with <coughs> Arun Zakaria there, who was a, a, a virologist and an elephant biologist who uh, 
sort of his way of caring was to <clears throat> was to take take apart the the carcasses of dead elephants to try and sort of discover what it what the cause of death he would do autopsies essentially you know and was trying to preserve the elephants in the wild but in in this case all forms of human care were not enough and i think if i would say the main purpose of our article there writing about these elephants and the virus was really to refute the idea that humans are the masters of the masters of the universe right that we can uh decide um through our our care and attention uh who lives and who dies because even when even when you're you're loving an elephant uh so much that you cry at its death you you find that you can actually be harming it at the same you can be harming them at the same time um you know so so it's really at the limits of human uh um, human masterfulness you know understanding that if we're going to live in this this world and flourish in this world maybe we have to be a little more humble about our capacities um as humans to control uh the world that we live in um and think a little bit more in these multi-species ways about uh the agency of non-humans um and in this case it was a virus right thinking about the virus that there was really no way for humans to uh control and master that virus um at least not to date and so uh you know being a little more humble i guess was maybe maybe one of the major points in that article about about human animal relations Baik, ini satu poin yang akan menarik nanti kita kaitkan dengan situasi sekarang, nah, khususnya terkait dengan uh, uh, coronavirus. Tetapi sebelum ke arah situ, uh, barangkali Celia bisa menjelaskan, uh, karena yang diuraikan tadi itu adalah salah satu konsep yang juga sering di, dikemukakan atau di, sudah ditulis oleh Celia uh, sebagai virus script. Nah, ini ini menarik untuk di, di, di elaborasi lebih lanjut. Karena dari situ kita nanti akan bisa bicara lebih jauh tentang uh, situasi sekarang yang terkait dengan uh, coronavirus ini. Uh, bisa tolong dijelaskan sedikit uh, apa itu virus script, uh, konsep seperti apa itu, Celia? Oke, okay. so thank you. I would like to go back just a little bit to what I was speaking about earlier, um, what kind of work I do. And so I consider the work I do to be the environmental humanities. Um, And at part, as part of that, I've developed certain metaphorical concepts. Uh, well, one on my own, the viral clouds, and the other with my colleague Ursula Munster, the viral creep. Um, and these are really metaphors for ways of understanding things about uh, uh, human viral relations. The viral cloud is a metaphor that, it's a metaphor for understanding uncertainty. Um, the uncertainty, which is even more clear with COVID-19, um, but the uncertainty of, uh, of what really uh, is going on or is going to happen with this um, invisible entity. Um, so this is the way I, I wrote about it uh, in uh, my article on the viral clouds. Um, I said H5N1 is a cloud of particles, uncertain ontologies, multiplying narratives and apocalyptic dreams that spread from mainland Southeast Asia to Indonesia in 2003. Um, so it's a, a cloud of the viral particles, but also uncertain ways of being. We're uncertain about how we're going to act uh, in relation to this virus. Um, the multiplying narratives. So there's many ways of speaking about this. There's many things we can say, many ways of talking about it. Uh, many stories that we're telling and apocalyptic dreams. So dreams of the end of the world, right? That this virus will be, become a global pandemic that causes the end of the world or brings about the end of the world as we know it, um, probably not literally in the case of influenza. Um, so that was one uh, metaphor, the metaphor for uncertainty. And the, another in the elephant article that was called the viral creep. And that was um, 
a, a metaphor um, uh, that, uh, um, well, here's how I wrote about it in that article. I say, the term viral creep reflects the capacity of the EEHV virus to suddenly take control of the life chances of another individual or species under conditions of stress and disturbance and then just as quickly recede into the background for an individual or a population. So this metaphor builds off of the, the nature of the herpes virus. It's something that comes out under stress and then it recedes. Uh, <clears throat> it recedes just as quickly. And you don't really know when this is going to happen uh, or uh, uh, what will cause it, what will bring it on. It's just all of a sudden there, right? Um, so this was a metaphor that really reflected the um, uncertainty and again back to that incapacity of humans to manage and control. Um, it, the virus would creep out uh, and uh, um, but it also would recede and it would it would live inside of the host um, inside neurons or, well, in human, it's, it's, humans, it's inside neurons. In elephants, they don't actually know where the virus recedes to. Um, but then it can come out and kill a, an elephant that has been infected years before um, or suddenly uh, kill a, a baby. Juveniles are most affected by this, this disease. Um, so really, the, both of these words, the viral cloud and the viral creep, were ways of, of inventing terminology that um, was metaphorical and illustrated these larger, larger concepts um, about living together with uh, viruses, these entities that are mysterious and that we don't control. Oh, uh, Fajar, it looks like you're you're muted now. Ya, yeah, sorry, sorry. There you go. Jadi uh, tadi uh, beberapa poin yang disebut oleh Celia seperti uncertain way, multiplying narratives, apocalyptic dreams, terus kemudian sesuatu yang comes out and recedes, dan juga incapacity of human to control. Ini nampaknya semua terjadi dalam situasi COVID-19 sekarang ini. Uh, apakah kalau kita ingin menggunakan misalnya konsep itu uh, yang dikemukakan oleh Celia, uh, baik itu viral cloud maupun viral creeps dalam uh, konteks COVID-19 dan kita ingin men melihat assemblage uh, yang terjadi dalam dalam konteks ini. Uh, Bagaimana itu? Apakah uh, kita bisa menggunakan konsep-konsep uh, itu as it is, atau barangkali kita perlu modifikasi dan barangkali situasi yang COVID-19 tidak sama persis dengan situasi pada saat flu burung maupun uh, dengan konteks uh, elephant virus? Yeah. Ada any thoughts on this? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so the biggest difference between COVID-19 and the H5N1 uh, 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 issue that I studied is, <clears throat> is uh, that the current coronavirus is not speculative. It's not a potential. And that makes all the difference in the world analytically in terms of how it's studied. Um, H5N1, studying H5N1 was about um, looking at the sociality of pandemic preparedness, what it meant to be prepared. It was, um, as the anthropologist Carlo Kadaf calls it, an event with a future orientation. He, he names that the pandemic perhaps. So that's his metaphor, is that it's the pandemic perhaps. Um, so H5N1 was at the center of speculation, a speculative deadly event. Um, with COVID-19, as we all know, we're not in a speculative event. We're in an event that is uh, unfolding in front of us in real time. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's out there. 
um, it, I think the viral creep metaphor is maybe still apt because we don't know the minute, you know, we don't know the thing we touch or the air that we breathe or the person that we stand next to that will end up being the one that gives us the virus. Um, likewise, uh, it's, I was just amazed at how often the term cloudy was appearing in news reports early on um, about, uh, co about COVID-19. Um, there is so much that we don't know about it. Um, it's still a, a cloudy mystery. So, for example, where did the virus originate? Um, if we want to follow the natural science of COVID-19, um, you know, we we know we 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 can be quite confident that it's a, um, a an anthropogenic uh, event that brought humans and bats and perhaps pangolins and perhaps other things into such close proximity um uh but we don't really know and probably we will in five years know the path that that it took um, um does it respond to different climates um does uh the, uh, the humid tropical climate of indonesia um matter to the virus does the um, Northern Hemisphere or Southern Hemisphere summer matter to the virus. Um, uh, do children spread the virus? If we want to open schools, um, we know that children uh, experience less severe disease than, than others, but are they spreaders? If they're not spreaders, then they won't infect teachers and adults to the same extent that uh, that they would if, uh, if they spread it, just like um, they do in influenza, for example, where children are very involved. So all, it's really interesting, all of the scientific questions. You see, as an anthropologist, I'm responsible to follow these uh, moments of making natural science, making the natural, the story of the natural history of this virus and, and looking at what it does. Um, in order to understand uh, its intersection with the, the social story, right? And it's just as mysterious. Um, it, COVID-19, as far as I can see, is really nothing but questions, you know? It, it took four months in the United States for them to decide that everyone should be wearing a mask, right? Um, that was a big uh, question until, until all of a sudden it wasn't. Um, uh, so I think um, COVID-19 is so much broader because it's an actual event. Um, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's scientific questions are broader. Um, it's impact on communities is wider. Um, you know, you could pretty much ignore the pandemic prepa preparedness for H5N1 uh, in, the, in the 2000s uh, in Indonesia if you wanted to. Um, or, you know, or it may just, you know, it just wasn't that prevalent. But my guess is, I'm not in Indonesia, but I guess it, my guess is that no one really is ignoring the, the COVID-19. Um, you know, you may think it's not relevant to you, but you're certainly going to know about it and uh, uh, be aware of it um, and, and have to think about it uh, in Indonesia today is my guess. Um, I, I don't know, but that's my guess. Um, so the impact on communities is wider. Um, the impact on governance uh, is is broader, um, and also the disparities that uh, that one cares about as as an anthropologist today. Um, the disparities are more concrete and more real. So with H five N one, there was concern that, um, for example, uh, by the Minister of Health, that if um, if, in, if uh, there was an actual outbreak that Indonesia would not have the supplies of uh, medicine that it needed um, because the medicines had already been bought up and stockpiled by uh, wealthy countries. Um, that, was, that was speculative. It was part of the speculative uh, nature of the outbreak. Um, it was still a question of, of uh, justice and inequality. 
but it's that's different than looking at actual statistics to see who has died in COVID-19 and uh, who hasn't, where the deaths are occurring and where they're not, who's out of a job and who isn't. Um, these are concrete disparities on the ground that, uh, that we can study and uh, use to really understand um, what, what's happening with COVID-19. So, so for me, the fact that it's not a speculative event and that we're not looking conceptually at this idea of speculation and preparedness with a future orientation, but rather we're looking at the current, uh, the current moment. Um, that's the biggest difference uh, in terms of studying it as an anthropologist. Itu mem membawa kita ke pertanyaan yang terakhir sebelum kita buka uh, diskusi dengan teman-teman. Uh, 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 sebagai antropolog, sebagai antropolog, Celia, saya mencoba untuk ke membayangkan antropologi zaman dulu yang uh, biasanya meneliti satu komunitas yang yang kecil dan yang disebut participant observas or observation adalah tinggal di sana secara periode yang cukup lama terus kemudian uh, uh, mengalami uh, day to day life komunitas itu nah uh, dengan skala pandemik yang seperti ini yang Celia gambarkan tadi sebagai uh, worldwide dan ini bahkan uh, melebihi dari skala uh, uh, kasus uh, flu burung tahun 2000-an. Nah, sebagai antropolog bagaimana kita uh, meneliti ini? Metode seperti apa? Saya rasa misalnya dengan multi-sided research pun dengan berusaha untuk melihat uh, skala yang sangat luas seperti ini itu uh, metode multisited menjadi sesuatu yang yang juga uh, sulit dilakukan atau barangkali saya lihat punya pandangan tentang uh, bagaimana sebaiknya kita untuk sebagai peneliti ya tidak hanya antropolog tapi juga peneliti ilmu sosial yang lain kalau ingin melihat aspek-aspek uh, yang tadi disebut misal assemblages, multispecies relation dan lain sebagainya. What kind of a, a proper methodology yang kita bisa kita bisa uh, aplikasikan dalam 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 penelitian tentang COVID-19 ini? Um, thank you for that question about methodology. Um, so as an anthropologist. I still care about and still favor um, conversations with people about how they're experiencing the world, how they're experiencing an event or a phenomena, even when that event or phenomena is named global. So COVID-19 is named global, but COVID-19 is going to be different for me than it is for, say, my students uh, who I teach. It's going to be different for me and my students than it might be for um, a, a professor and their students in Indonesia. It's going to be different in Jakarta than it is in uh, um, Yogyakarta or the Togian Islands where I've spent time. Um, and uh, so I think it's still worth knowing about those um, life worlds and ways of experiencing something even when that thing is given the name global. Um, the Something we call the globe is always experienced differently in different places. Uh, just because we call it global doesn't mean that it's now universal. Um, so I think, uh, I think um, looking at the experience of um, Uh, COVID-19 um, at specific sites and locations, uh, you know, to bring us back to the theme of all of these talks, uh, area studies, regional studies, uh, to, to look at how uh, a phenomenon is different uh, across uh, space. Um, uh, and also, you know, anthropologists probably at least since the 80s have, have been very interested in history. Sometimes the historians think we're poaching on their territory, but 
Um, I would say you can't do anthropology today without a good understanding of history. So COVID-19 doesn't emerge um, out of nowhere into nowhere. It emerges, uh, it, it itself has a history. As I said, we don't know what that history is yet, um, but uh, it emerges in places that have histories and that those histories make a big uh, difference. So for example, in the United States, uh, COVID-19 emerged into a, a country which had uh, a, a history of four or 500 years of anti-Black racism. And so COVID-19 then overlaps with um, uh, protests again for, for uh, Black Lives Matter. Um, you know, that's not, that, that exact phenomena wouldn't happen in the same way in Indonesia. COVID-19 is going to emerge into other concerns and other cares and other histories. Um, so that's why we need to think about uh, localities, areas, regions, uh, uh, and we need to use our best ethnographic methods of face-to-face uh, uh, -face interaction, talking to people, caring about what people say, caring about how they describe what's meaningful to them and their lives um, uh, in order to, to understand this new phenomena as it's emerging. Kalau saya bisa bilang di Indonesia uh, itu uh, overlaps dengan masalah-masalah uh, yang terkait dengan agama, saya lihat. Jadi, uh, Ini satu hal yang barangkali menjadi ranah yang uh, cukup menarik juga untuk dilihat bagaimana overlap antara uh, COVID-19 dengan 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 hal-hal uh, yang terkait dengan agama karena banyak sekali kasus-kasus uh, klaster yang justru muncul dari kegiatan-kegiatan uh, keagamaan terutama pada awal-awalnya dan ini juga kan seperti kita tahu juga terjadi di Korea Selatan misalnya. Dan juga banyak ke hal-hal yang apa namanya beberapa statement-statement dari pemuka, the so-called pemuka agama itu cukup cukup bisa dipertanyakan terkait dengan COVID-19. Misalnya dia hukuman dari atas terus kemudian tidak akan akan segera hilang kalau kita rajin berwudu dan lain sebagainya. Jadi saya pikir ini ini satu satu uh, ranah atau satu area yang harus lebih banyak dieksplorasi uh, oleh para antropolog dan dan uh, ilmu sosial uh, kalau kita melakukan penelitian tentang uh, assemblages yang yang terkait dengan COVID-19. Yeah. Tapi kita mungkin bisa elaborasi ini nanti dalam diskusi uh, selanjutnya. Uh, atau barangkali Celia punya poin uh, singkat tentang soal agama ini. Saya tahu. Uh, saya lihat tidak melakukan penelitian secara khusus tentang ini, tetapi barangkali da dapat info dari uh, muridnya yang yang meneliti agama itu. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. No, my mahasiswa have studied the uh, agama in Indonesia, and no, it just it sounds like it makes perfect sense, right? It's so that's why we can't study. You know, I. I my my colleagues in political science very often imagine they can use one method or one theory uh, to to look at, for example, rational choice, how people make rational choices in relation to whatever it is, the virus in this case, you know, and and really without so as an anthropologist, really without understanding the history, social and cultural context, uh, you know, it, it you can't say anything meaningful. Um, uh, or very little meaningful. So, so um, you know, so I think that's a perfect example of how if we were to, that we couldn't study COVID-19 in a universal fashion, we would have to look at this history in the United States or this history in uh, Indonesia that make uh, either religion or uh, a race the, the sort of salient uh, material that really wells up and and uh, uh, gets dis disturbed and reordered to make this new new world new formation um, new uh, rearranged relations uh, as a result or as a consequence or um, alongside maybe maybe even just adjacent to 
the virus. Yes. Baik, terima kasih Celia. Uh, sudah sekitar satu jam kita berbincang dan sekarang saya rasa saya akan memberikan kesempatan buat bapak-bapak uh, peserta uh, audiens untuk berkomentar atau memberikan satu pertanyaan uh, kepada Celia atau ke saya juga boleh. Uh, pertanyaan boleh dalam bahasa Indonesia. Uh, nanti akan dijawab oleh Celia dalam bahasa Inggris. Uh, saya akan ada dua dua kelompok. Penanya di sini yang satu yang langsung bertanya melalui Zoom dan satu lagi yang bertanya melalui uh, channel YouTube. Uh, barangkali saya akan mulai dulu dengan yang di Zoom karena yang di YouTube uh, saya harus membacakan itu uh, pertanyaannya. Dan saya pertanyaan pertama ini datang dari uh, Bung Beni Baskara ya, Bung Beni Baskara. Uh, sebentar. Oke, okay, uh, saya minta tolong uh, Fatma atau Fikri tolong di unmute untuk uh, mic-nya Bung Ben Baskara supaya bisa langsung bertanya kepada kepada Celia. Halo Bung Ben. Halo, ya terima ya, kasih atas Bung ben. kesempatannya Pak Fajar. Ya hmm. ini saya ingin bertanya kepada Pak Fajar dengan Bu Celia. Selamat malam, Bu Celia. Ini pertanyaan saya. Ya. Pertanyaan saya itu tentang pernyataan pemerintah yang beberapa waktu yang lalu itu membuka PSBB menuju new normal. Itu pernyataannya adalah uh, kita harus hidup berdamai dengan virus. Nah, di dalam kehidupan yang baru ini, kita harus berdamai dengan virus. Nah, saya ingin uh, tanggapan dari Ibu Celia dan Pak Fajar mengenai pernyataan pemerintah ini. Bagaimana sebenarnya konsep uh, hidup berdamai dengan virus itu? Gitu. Terima kasih Pak Fajar dan Bu Celia. Silakan Celia. So, so the question, as I understand it, is that it's been proposed we live uh, we live at peace or in peace with the virus, um, or we make peace with the virus would be, is that right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't attempt to answer that question in terms of right or wrong. Yes, we should make peace with the virus. No, we shouldn't make peace with the virus. Um, that's be really beyond my capacity. Instead, what I would say is uh, I would want to ask a few ethnographic questions about that statement. So I would want to know um, who is making that statement? What does peace, making peace with the virus mean to them? Uh, is it uh, a scientific calculation that uh, we will allow 5% uh, of our population to die? Um, and, uh, you know, that's either God's will or that's the vi just what's going to have to happen. Um, or is it a, you know, is it a, what, what kind of statement is it? So I, I would um, begin to ask some ethnographic questions about uh, the, the, the person who made it, their institution, um, their, their motivations, their information, where they get their information. Um, and what they're trying to achieve with their statement. What is the goal of that statement? Is the statement to, um, uh, for example, that kind of statement you very often hear uh, from people trying to promote the economy, um, especially in the United States. Uh, so that, that uh, is a e economy over epidemiology kind of statement. Is that what the statement is? Um, no, so, so I can't answer, should we make peace with the virus uh, for you? But uh, I can say that as an anthropologist, I wanna dig into a lot of questions around such a statement. And that that's exactly what uh, viral ethnography would look like. Um, who may, who's making uh, major important statements uh, about the virus and from what perspective and based on what information? Um, that, that's really how I, how I would approach it. Then also one important point is I think the differences in political, political uh, structures. I mean, those people 
uh, at the local government per perhaps it's different has a different leverage from the people in the central government and they might have different kind of uh, understanding of what berdamai dengan virus means yeah. dan saya rasa pembas yang tinggal di kendari ini akan menarik untuk melihat bagaimana mana bagaimana pandangan mereka ya uh, tidak hanya masyarakat tapi juga government officials di 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 kendari terkait dengan apa sebenarnya yang mereka pahami tentang berdamai dengan virus itu right gitu saya bungkus ya silakan yeah. yeah. Also, what kind of alternatives are there to making peace with the virus? If you're representing a government um, that's given, you know, uh, I'm thinking about, um, you know, some of the local health departments in the United States that don't really have enough money to do contact tracing in a, in a robust way. Um, you know, sometimes making peace with the virus is a way of speaking about Um, the fact that you aren't, you don't have good alternatives. Maybe your budget isn't big enough. Maybe there aren't appropriate medicines. Maybe there aren't uh, uh, appropriate hospital resources. So making peace with the virus can can have a lot to say about actual conditions on the ground as well. Ya, bagaimana Bung Bas? Cukup jelas ya? Ya, terima kasih banyak Ibu Celia dengan Pak Fajar. Ya, terima kasih. Nah, pertanyaan berikutnya datang dari uh, YouTube, dari uh, mungkin dari Thailand ini ya, uh, Pak Apicai Suncin Suncinda, Apicai Suncinda. Jadi saya bacakan saja pertanyaannya. Bats are carriers of. Pak Apicai juga ada di sini Pak? Oh ada, ada. Kalau ada, uh, so, ya. Uh, Mr. Apichai Sunchinda, uh, if you can uh, post your question directly to Celia. Uh, oh yeah, I see him. Do... Yeah, He, okay. Someone has to unmute him, I think. Yeah, Fir, uh, Fatma, atau... Oh, am I unmute now? <laughs> yeah, you are unmute now. Please, go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, all right. Yeah. Thank yes. you. Yeah, okay, basically, uh, you know, bats have been... Uh, known to be carriers of this COVID-19 virus, all right? And uh, many Asian societies have contact with bats, right? Whether <laughs> catching them, consuming them, or trading them. Uh, but yet, so far, it seems that uh, Asian uh, uh, you know, countries have suffered much less compared to the other countries. So I'm just wondering, is there some ethnic explanation For such outcomes, whether it's in the DNA or in the social, cultural, or anthropological, you know, aspect, you know, how do you explain this sort of a disparity in this uh, thing? Um, and can I just go to my second question too, or you want me to wait? <laughs> just go ahead. Yeah. Uh, then the second question is a much more, well, talking about history and more philosophical one, is that you know the the other big pandemic in human history is the Black Death pandemic or the bubonic plague in the 14th century, which some estimates kill up to at least 100 to 200 million people at that time, which is quite a big number. Uh, but what is interesting is that at least in the European uh, scene, that led to the Renaissance period of a scientific and social transformation uh, in Europe, all right? Uh, and that is you know, historically documented. So my question now is whether we can expect a Renaissance 2.0 post-COVID or otherwise, can we create one? Thank you. Okay, Celia. Yeah, well, that's Please. a lovely question. It would be lovely <laughs> if we, uh, uh, you know, I, I hadn't even thought of that intellectual uh, and artistic Renaissance, but that's a really good point. Um, I actually believe that, uh, you know, I'm surrounded by my own country and my own conditions. And I actually believe we're going to see an end of the 30 or <clears throat> 35 years of neoliberalism because of this virus. Um, that's just my wild speculation. Um, so I think it's going to have a have an impact. Um, 
uh, and it's also coming at a time when people are tired of certain uh, uh, oppressive formations. Um, and this may be what helps us to uh, get rid of some of them. Um, but again, that's wild, wild speculation. Um, the first question was, uh, oh, uh, is there something about Asia? So, um, uh, uh, you know, the people, uh, people, there are bats all over the world. Um, they're one of the most common mammals uh, in the world. Um, uh, I would be very, very reluctant to go to any form of biological uh, explanation. Um, uh, in the first place, uh, uh, the United States has a very large Asian population and uh, a large Southeast Asian population and Southeast Asians in the United States uh, get COVID-19 just as easily as anybody else. So um, I would not follow any kind of uh, biological explanation. Um, I think there is uh, interesting uh, research to be done. I know I have a, a undergraduate honor student right now who wants to pursue the question of authoritarianism uh, and whether authoritarianism conveys some kind of advantage in this this kind of situation. Um, uh, um, uh, I, uh, what else can I say about that? Um, I think that there is going to be a lot to be studied about uh, uh, how COVID-19 progresses or has progressed in uh, each country in Southeast Asia or in Asia in general. Um, uh, but uh, I would really want to avoid any kind of essentialist explanation and instead look for, um, look for uh, uh, history, uh, particular um, biological details of uh, the way the virus um, uh, has uh, spread. Um, and uh, you know that's that's the way I would want to go, uh, especially as an anthropologist. And I would focus less on um, uh, general traits that that one might want to refer to as Asian. Um, so that would be my opinion. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, the 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 next question is also coming from. Uh, YouTube uh, live chat uh, from Dia, Dia Irawati. Uh, I think she's not uh, in Zoom, so I'll just uh, read her questions. Uh, how do you see and analyze the issue of power and structure in the framework of assemblages in the interconnection between humans and non-humans? And how does the agency of non-humans work in the viral connections and infections and in multi-species uh, approach in general. So, silakan, Celia. Yeah, the, the question of the agency of nature has been a, a um, sort of vibrant one for a while in um, science and technology studies, uh, in multi-species studies, um, uh, and I think it's a very important question. Um, uh, you know, I needed to be able to follow, uh, that, that's why I keep going back to the, the natural science as being such an important uh, uh, companion of mine in thinking through uh, the, the virus and not only a singular natural science, but multiple natural sciences. So for example, with H H5N1, um, so much of the natural science had to do with cladistics or the taxonomy of the virus. Um, and so little of it had to do with what was going on evolutionarily in uh, the hen house. So uh, the industrial hen house, right? In industrial agriculture. So that's precisely where the question of power comes in. Why is it that uh, natural scientists were um, working so diligently to come up with uh, the proper cladistics for the virus. Uh, uh, and, and uh, you know, there were so few um, uh, evolutionary biologists looking at how dangerous this industrial production is. Um, so that's, that's sort of an example. Um, 
and the the you know for viruses viruses are quite inscrutable they're hard to understand you don't see them uh, you only intimate when you've been in proximity to one you need a, a diagnosis um, uh, or some kind of symptom that tells you you've been near one or one has infected you. Um, you still don't know where it is in your body or how much of it you have. Um, so viruses are quite inscrutable. Um, but we can know something about uh, their evolution and under what conditions they will change in what directions. Um, especially I focused on this uh, evolution, this uh, uh, you know, mutations that add virulence or make a de more deadly viruses, right? So, so that is a, a form of agency for sure. Um, uh, that's a form of, uh, of um, change, um, not necessarily conscious or motivated, right? But it's a uh, change under particular uh, social, human social conditions, um, and uh, change in relation to uh, poultry biology and what goes on inside of a chicken, right? Or a wild bird. Um, so, uh, uh, but then there are other, when as the assemblage moves out from these sites of biological interaction, you also have, uh, for example, post-colonial power relations between for example, the Indonesian Ministry of Health and the um, uh, World Health Organization, right? And those, those, the WHO and the um, Ministry of Health become nodes in your assemblage uh, uh, that are circulating around your problem, your problem space of, of the virus and the outbreak. And, and uh, so uh, those are, in, in those situations, you have more classical forms of human, uh, human power relation. So, um, yeah, so you're, I, guess, I guess I would see those as different levels or different scales. Ya, yeah, isti itu topik tentang postcolonial relation ini menjadi menarik karena Celia sendiri menulis secara khusus tentang itu dalam tulisannya yang uh, viral cloud ya. Uh, bagaimana relasi pemerintah Indonesia dengan Amerika Serikat khususnya laboratorium Nambru ya ingat okay. saya ingat waktu itu kita saya menemani Celia untuk uh, interview dengan uh, Bu Endang yang waktu itu sedang saya menjabat sebagai uh, Menteri Kesehatan isu-isu uh, seperti ini sebenarnya menarik juga untuk kita lihat dalam konteks uh, pandemik ini ya. bagaimana postcolonial relation ini terbentuk dan sejauh mana ini berpengaruh dalam uh, uh, konfigurasi assemblage ini juga Ya. Tapi itu satu isu yang memang kita kita buka barangkali ada bapak-bapak ibu-ibu nanti yang akan tertarik untuk meneliti ini. Nah pertanyaan berikutnya dari uh, Ibu Yakti, silakan Bu Yakti. Terima kasih. Uh, tolong Fatma, ya. Oh, oke, okay. oke, okay, thank you. So my question is actually you mentioned about the uh, uh, doing field work, ethnographic field work. So how will you do during this uh, uh, pandemic? And also because you mentioned that I prefer to talk to people. So how will you do it, especially in Indonesia? Not if it in the city, maybe it's a facility, it's okay, you can get the internet access. But for people who stay in the uh, remote area or, or maybe like the, the place that you done the research, so it's maybe quite difficult, but how you can continue to do to do this? And also now the question is observation is very important for us, right? For anthropology, I'm anthropologist also. So, but how can you do that? Because you have to know the situation and so the smell. Like for me, if I want to see the dancing performance for the Dayak people, it will be very difficult because maybe I have to hire people or maybe, well, well, but it's quite difficult also to, yeah, so this kind of, of, of thing that it will be difficult for us, but maybe you have experience for that. So can you uh, give, uh, give us a clue how to do it? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, yeah, thank you um, that's a That's a great question. Um, I think it's very hard at the moment. So, 
Uh, I even have one uh, graduate student who's had to, uh, Indonesian graduate student, who's had to change his work from a project in Indonesia to a project to studying COVID-19 in the United States because he can't get home to do that work. And if he gets home, he can't get back here and, and uh, to finish the work. And, and so it's very, very hard. Um, so I think that we need to, um, uh, you know, so I, I won't be doing any research on COVID in, in Indonesia. Um, you know, I may find some things on the internet that give me something to say, but I won't be having any kind of project on COVID in Indonesia. Um, uh, but maybe we need to, um, you know, I, I had been still writing on H5N1, and then I thought, well, I should be writing on COVID. Um, you know, one method I've thought of is uh, what's called autoethnography, um, where you put uh, your own experience, um, a, a sort of biographical experience into the, the narrative of what's happening. And um, we certainly are allowed to, to talk about ourselves and our, our own experiences. And, you know, I think some people who do autoethnography imagine that they're interviewing their own selves. Um, and they think of the questions that they should perhaps be asking in this situation, and they ask them of themselves. Um, so, so uh, bringing in autoethnography is uh, a, a, a possibility, and then changing the project from you know if you can't go, I don't know where you're located, Buyekti, but if you um, uh, can't go to see dancing uh, Dayak uh, performance. Um, you know, do you still ha do you still have uh, do you still have enough knowledge of the location and enough contacts there that you can begin a conversation with people about what their experience is now? So I might ask, you know, is this how is this affecting um, how is the inability to dance affecting and uh, perform and maybe interact affecting people in the place that you're most familiar with? Um, uh, what does it mean to lose dance all of a sudden? Uh, uh, are people still social distancing or are they dancing anyway? I mean, my, my daughter's in a dance troupe and they, have, uh, they are planning um, some outdoor dancing and they've had to cancel many indoor performances. Um, and it's been just devastating to all of the, the children involved. But, now, now the instructor is thinking, what would it look like to move to uh, an exterior outdoor space, you know? So if I were interested in dance, I could track those, you know, so always looking for what's new, what is coming out of this rearranged situation? That would be my basic question. What is emerging from the present moment? Um, and it may mean that your project changes, but it changes to track uh, newness and emergence rather than uh, tradition and uh, uh, the way things have always been done. Yeah, yeah. thank you for the question. Yeah, bagaimana Bu Yakti? Sudah uh, okay? Yeah, thank you ini, so much. Yeah, thank you so much ini, because yeah. Senior saya yeah. di Lipi, saya lihat. Ya. Okay, Jadi, <laughs> good suggestion. Thank you so much. So you can you can ask this question tomorrow actually and tomorrow morning question, <laughs> which I I don't think they will consider this as important <laughs> anyway. <laughs> okay, uh, so one point that I really like to highlight is the newness and uh, reemergence. I think this is a very important point that we we have to uh, discuss. Uh, uh, in the future in terms of uh, not only methodology but issue, issues issues that can we be uh, coming out of these uh, situations so i think uh, uh, i will take this uh, take a note on, on this kind of uh, 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 ideas um next question is dari uh, Yunika gloria yeah. uh, dari northwestern silakan Betul. Uh, Selamat malam. Terima kasih. Selamat malam juga. Uh, terima kasih Pak Fajar. Uh, good night, uh, Bu Celia. Uh, I'm also in the US. I'm in Evanston, Northwestern. So we're in the same uh, time zone. 
So thank you so much for sharing your research and explanation on the contingency of care, particularly with love and care, because it reminds me to what uh, Juno Parenas writes in her book, Decolonizing Extinction About Orangutan Rehabilitation, that the temporal contingency of being hurt and sustaining life at the same time is conditional in the practice of care. So for me, this understanding is vivid when we talk about mammals or domesticated animals. But I'm still curious about uh, the correlation between what you're doing with virus and care, because I think there is a different process of embodiment like you already explained. So uh, the, the question is pretty straightforward. How we talk about care within the uncertainty you highlight when we talk about virus as invisible entity of which what visible in front of many of us is not the virus itself, but the symptoms and the effects. So I'm just wondering about what you're taking up on this correlation. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Unika. That's a really great point. I like it a lot. Um, so maybe I should highlight different definitions of care. There's There would be caring for, so that's what the zookeepers were doing for the orangutan or the um, elephants. Um, and then there's uh, caring ab about um, and uh, caring enough, you know, especially for an anthropologist to care about the details of uh, viral evolution is a is an unusual thing, right? Mm -hmm. So caring, um, caring enough to follow or track um, uh, what's what's happening with this mysterious entity might be that that sense of care. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not quite sure, but I I think um, uh, uh, you know if if the viral entity is going to emerge to rearrange uh, the relations between people, poultry, elephants, mammals, uh, uh, things that are visible and uh, evoke love because mm -hmm. I not sure I'd go so far to say that the virus evokes any love, right? It might mm -hmm. evoke some hate, but not probably love, right? So if the virus is going to affect uh, those things that we care for, um, uh, because we love them, then uh, then we need to know something about it too. And mm -hmm. um, you know, people have written about um, sort of the lives of noxious things, noxious weeds, or deadly mm -hmm. um, uh, fungi, or uh, um, you know, the things, or or uh, people write about rats. And uh, um, you know, so so, um, you know, I I, I read uh, one interesting story about um, the uh, rats coming uh, across uh, the Atlantic aboard slave ships, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, a focus on how things were transformed by these uh, these rats. Um, you know, we, we can, I think we can care about the things that we don't necessarily love mm -hmm. um, by, by paying attention to them and giving them the, the attention that they, they deserve to, mm -hmm. to, again, look at these uh, transformed relations uh, uh, with, with, with them. And, and, and to some extent, maybe the way you know the way, i mean i think it's pretty clear that the world would not be a better place if all of these things that we dislike were taken off it and maybe our planet mm -hmm. would not even function right if it mm -hmm. didn't have fungi and and viruses and bacteria and um you know our, we have a huge number of uh viral genes in our own human bodies um yep. so looking at looking at things things that way. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Thanks. that might help, yeah. but it's a great question and I'm glad you brought Juno Paranius' work into it. Thank you so much, Ms. Elia. You're welcome. Yeah. What, what department are you in, Unika? Sorry, uh, she got muted. <laughs> I just, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm in history department. History, okay, yeah. lovely. I think you are in history of science, right? Right, right. I'm doing intellectual history and history of science. <laughs> okay.
Oke, okay, terima kasih. Dan saya rasa itu sangat penting dan buat saya juga penting soal embodiment gitu. Tadi yang saya juga ter, terpikir bagaimana soal soal ini. Jadi artinya bicara tentang tentang virus sesuatu yang 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 bisa dibilang invisible, kuat dan kuat ya. Nah, itu menjadi visible pada pada saat kita menjadikannya spesimen dalam laboratorium kan. Artinya itu yang sudah diteliti seperti misalnya uh, latur uh, pada saat meneliti bakterial. Dua hari yang sama sebenarnya, uh, virus dan bakteria, sesuatu yang invisible kemudian menjadi visible pada saat kita menjadikannya kategori. Nah ini yang yang menarik nih, dan untuk terkait dengan COVID-19, nah, ini satu peluang riset yang sebenarnya menarik untuk dilihat dari kerangka uh, STS. Uh, cuma saya tidak tahu siapa yang uh, tertarik untuk melakukan hal ini. Ya, eh, berikutnya eh, pertanyaan eh, sebentar ini kalau tidak salah dari ya dari Bang Oji, Bang Nur Fauzi Rahman, Bang Oji eh, silakan Bang Oji, tolong eh, di unmute. Halo. Um, Halo. Apa kabar? Ya baik sudah lama nggak ketemu. Iya saya. Um, mendengarkan dari awal termasuk uh, percakapan yang bagus sekali dengan Ibnu Tufail. Saya rasa ini <tuh> terima kasih. Benar, benar itu pertanyaan-pertanyaan dan cara saya rasa saya sangat menikmati cara uh, percakapan seperti ini. Begini, saya uh, punya satu pertanyaan khusus mengenai usability atau atau manfaat dari konsep assemblage in, untuk dipakai. Ini agak susah diterjemahkan di bahasa Indonesia apa ya sebenarnya. Jadi, jadi saya tulis di dalam di dalam pertanyaan ini um, kurang lebih begini. Um, apa yang dapat ditawarkan oleh konsep assemblage untuk memahami pengalaman um, berhadapan dengan virus yang tidak terlihat ini? Jadi pengalaman ini seperti suatu mulai dari merasa khawatir ya takut hingga merasa terteror. Nah, bentuk-bentuknya di lapangan itu seperti kalau di gated communities mereka mereka bikin portal dan di portal itu dipasang dilarang masuk karena mencegah penyebaran virus jadi virus itu dipersonalisasi dalam hubungan sosial antara uh, orang yang datang membawa dengan uh, gated communities yang yang memproteksi diri. Jadi ini yang saya sebut sebagai uh, apa namanya pengalaman mengutamakan selamat uh, dengan mempersonalisasi yang tidak terlihat menjadi terlihat di dalam hubungan sosial. Nah ini yang yang mungkin eh, perlu suatu apa penjelasan yang eh, Celia bisa tambahkan apa yang bisa ditawarkan oleh konsep assemblage ini untuk untuk mencakup pengalaman-pengalaman dari orang-orang yang merasa being threatened atau being terrorized. Um, oleh sesuatu yang tidak terlihat ini dan sementara memang ini adalah sesuatu yang digencarkan dibuat menjadi nyata termasuk oleh kematian-kematian yang dipublikasi setiap saat oleh pemerintah kemudian pekerjaan para medik uh, para profesional medik yang di rumah sakit menyelamatkan uh, orang dari uh, sakit COVID-19 secara khusus Kemudian juga pemerintah daerah yang membuat pemerintah daerah dan pusat yang membuat pengaturan-pengaturan baru yang itu eh, menghambat semua proses-proses sosial yang seperti biasa terjadi gitu. Nah itu 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 satu jenis pengalaman baru. Ini seperti pengalaman yang belum pernah terjadi dalam skala eh, yang sangat besar bahkan dalam kecepatan yang luar biasa. Bahkan ini teman saya menyebutnya sebagai revolusi. Uh, itu saja dulu, Celia. Dan 
uh, Ibn Tufai. Makasih. Ya, makasih Bang Oji. Uh, ini pertanyaan yang sangat menarik ini menurut saya dan dan kalau kalau saya boleh sedikit uh, kasih pengantar mungkin sebelum saya lihat jawab. Uh, persoalan yang menarik yang diuraikan oleh Bang Oji tadi ada persoalan translation sebenarnya. Kalau bicara assemblage kita selalu bicara translation kan. Artinya bagaimana translation dari sesuatu yang 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 enggak jelas ini kelihatan terus kalau menjadi sesuatu yang jelas dalam bentuk portal atau dalam bentuk uh, media news dan lain sebagainya. Jadi artinya dari sesuatu yang yang different kind of materiality is emerging di sini gitu ya. Materiality tidak langsung. Tapi ini satu hal yang menarik nih sebenarnya dalam dalam riset uh, COVID ini uh, kalau kita mau melakukan. Uh, tapi itu nanti kita bisa bahas uh, lebih jauh lagi dan uh, for the uh, uh, for the record juga saya mengalami kesulitan kesulitan bang Oji pada saat menerjemahkan assemblage ini dalam bahasa Indonesia. Saya sering menulis ini dalam proposal tapi gimana ini terjemahannya nggak ada yang nggak ada yang nggak ada yang pas rasanya gitu. Uh, Oke okay, Celia sil- silakan. <tuh> Thank you so much, uh, OG, for your question. Um, so um, I'm not sure I completely captured the the entire question, but I'll I'll try and say something more about assemblage um, and the difficulty of translating it. So I think the idea of assemblage comes from the moment. Uh, from one of many moments in anthropology where the attempt is being made to get away from small uh, community uh, st- studies, the, the, um, the uh, you know, the history of anthropology, which imagined s- small communities that were essentially separated out from uh any kind of global or larger uh political context right and so um you know no no longer are you know it's it's the, the, the many anthropologists are no longer doing those kinds of local local studies right so so what what are the alternatives? Well, one is to think about so so to put instead of putting say a village at the center of the the research, what if you put a problem at the center of the research? And the problem can be coronavirus. The problem can be, you know, another another medical uh, issue. The problem can be. Um, we talked earlier about agama in Indonesia. You know, it can be the problem of religion. You, you take a problem instead of a location and you put that problem at the center of the research. And then what kinds of things do you need to know about to understand that problem? And what kinds of communities do you need to engage with to understand that problem? So my first research in Indonesia in the Togian Islands was <clears throat> was not quite any longer, but still pretty much a village level study. I spent a lot of time in a village. I also worked at a research station, a biological research station. So I had two locations, but there was the village, but then also everything I tried to do was connect it to this wider wider world. So if you take something very local like sea cucumber, collecting, you can actually connect that to a thousand year history of sea cucumbers being exported to, to China throughout Eastern Indonesia and the Northern, Northern Australia. So, <clears throat> so that study was still had this sense of groundedness in a place. But when I came to study H5N1, although I lived in Jogjakarta, there was not, it wasn't a study about H5N1 in Jogjakarta. I had to travel to, um, uh, I had to travel to uh, uh, Jakarta to talk to uh, health and uh, FAO and WHO and and people like that. I had to, I talked to um, people dealing with poultry in the Jogja region. Um, I had to talk to uh, uh, 
people in the United States who were um, interested in uh, pandemic preparedness in Indonesia and Southeast Asia. So what the assemblage was at that moment was opportunistic. And it was anything that I could phys that I could conceptually attach to my my problem, and my problem was the emergence of uh, H5N1 in Indonesia and the pressure from the external um, community, the external global uh, health community, to for Indonesia to respond in a certain way. Um, so there was no longer any village there, although I went to villages. Um, so then the question would be, what, what word is the right word um, to, uh, in Indonesia to express that? And I don't know, the image I'm getting in my head is of, do you know what a burr is? It's this little thing that's on a plant with little sharp edges, and when you walk through them, it, they stick onto your pants, right? So it's like a burr. It's like this little thing that sticks to your you know, so what, what sticks to the problem? What communities stick to your problem? Um, you know, so, so I think in Indonesia, you could come up with some metaphor like the burr of a plant or, you, or something where, where really what you're trying to express is you've got this problem, not a location. You don't start with a location. You start with an issue. And then what's gonna, what, what, what communities does that issue collect? And then there's a practical question. What, uh, who do you have access to, right? So uh, Fajar mentioned uh, that we interviewed uh, Ibu Endang. And that was a very, very um, difficult interview to get. And if I hadn't known him, I would never have, have been able to, to do that interview, right? So, um, uh, you know, so so what opportunities do you have? Who do you who do you know? Who can who who are you connected to? So so it's it's opportunistic and practical. Um, the assemblage is opportunistic and practical, as well as um, as well as con conceptual. You know, I may have wanted, for example, an interview with Siti Fadila Supari, but I was never going to get that. Um, so, so that isn't in, you know, that is, doesn't become part of the research in the same way. I can only access her public writings. Um, you know, so I think those are all the things that are in an, in an assemblage. And it's definitely a different kind of, of uh, anthropological research. Um, it's, it's not uh, oriented towards development. It's not oriented towards problem solving. Um, it's uh, oriented really towards conceptual conceptualization and conceptual understanding and expanding uh, our view of the world in a in a uh, humanistic uh, a way that then, if we want to do policy, uh, can allow for other things. But in and of itself, it's it's not um, development focused, and it doesn't. Uh, put people on any kind of scale as uh, the way uh, older anthropologists did of, you know, of worthy of being studied because they're, they were simpler, right? It doesn't do that. It, it puts the most complex thing like a government entity or a viral lab right up alongside a, a bird, bird uh, husbandry in Jogjakarta, you know, the, 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 I forget what you call those folks, but the people who, who like to collect those beautiful and very, very expensive or ornamental birds, right? So anybody can end up being important in the assemblage. Um, it's, uh, uh, but uh, it does take your creativity and your knowledge of history and culture and to, to choose um, to choose things that are appropriate to your problem. I guess that's how I, um, so I don't know what the word is in Indonesian. Tapi, tapi itu problem yang betul sekali, Celia. Saya ingin menggarisbawahi soal ini, ini konsepsual, konsepsual problem. Jadi bukan, bukan soal development atau policy. Karena saya menggunakan istilah assemblage ini sering kali di, di, di lembaga saya, di LIPI, dan sering selalu pertanyaan yang muncul, oke okay, kalau sudah begini gunanya apa ini untuk untuk <laughs> untuk pembangunan? 
saya selalu bilang it's, it's different kind of questions ya yeah. different kind of question juga karena just push on one question against another questions gitu jadi ini ini satu problem yang yang menurut saya dunianya uh, ranah uh, atau areanya memang berbeda dan saya saya memang pikir uh, bagus kita punya forum seperti ini dan mudah-mudahan teman-teman yang ada di sini juga dari Lipi juga juga bisa bisa uh, mulai melihat bahwa this is we are talking about something that is conceptual problem is not uh, development problem or, or policy bukan berarti itu sesuatu hal yang 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 apa namanya yang enggak bagus atau ini nah, itu yeah. itu simply it's a different kind of things yeah. terima kasih yeah, Celia sudah me, 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 sudah highlight soal ini <laughs> yeah so I'm sorry if I didn't capture all the nuances of uh... Oji's question there. Um, yeah, I think I might have missed some of the elements of it, but um, I'm sorry about that. Ya, yeah, nanti kita bisa diskusi lagi di Bung Oji uh, untuk uh, ini barangkali uh, satu forum sendiri untuk bicara soal antropologi ya, dan COVID-19 dan lain sebagainya. Uh, untuk selanjutnya, saya kasih saya berikan kesempatan kepada uh, Barangkali uh, oh, pertanyaan tentang asam belas dari Muhammad Indria Indrawan, saya pikir tadi sudah dijawab panjang lebar oleh Celia. Nah, kemudian pertanyaan berikutnya dari Bu Suraya Afif. Oke, okay, silakan Fatma tolong di unmute Bu Suraya Afif. Oke. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you can just read my question. Actually. Um, Thinking about relation between actors, uh, either human and non-human, uh, Bruno Latour uh, provide concept of uh, network. Uh, but uh, it seems uh, you prefer or you use assemblage from the Guthrie and Deleuze uh, uh, concept of assemblage. Uh, so I just want to ask, Uh, why for you assemblage is much more helpful for understanding or to try to you know uh, uh, tell the stories than the, the concept of network of rural tours so i just i just want to ask uh, why is that thank you okay celia um I, I I would say that I don't necessarily, I think that uh, uh, either could be used and I'm not sure that I'm prepared right at this moment to uh, distinguish them. Um, maybe I like Iwa Ong who wrote a lot about assemblage <laughs> better than uh, Bruno Latour. So maybe it's a politics of citation. Um, uh, I, I think that could be it. Um, but uh, uh, I don't think I, I, I'm sure that one could study up on this and make a, a good distinction, but I don't think I'm prepared to do that now, unfortunately. Thank you, though. Thanks. Oh, yeah. So I guess... can, I, can I ask a question? Yunita. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Ini tadi Bu Yunita baru saya mau kasih kesempatan <laughs> okay. perawatan dari Sudah. maaf. Okay, Yunita. unmute. Okay, yeah, no problem. Thank you very much for the very interesting uh, uh, experience yeah, of your study, Celia, about the virus. Now, uh, I have been thinking also about this, this problem, uh, but I uh, come from like uh, understanding, try to understand for, uh, people's knowledge, yeah, like the scheme of understanding uh, COVID-19, for example. I agree with you that uh, the concept of viral cloud is is what useful, yeah, because so many elements in in people's knowledge is is not there about the COVID, yeah, like uh, how it it the, the form of the COVID, how it spread, the effects, etc. So when it turns out that human to human contact now uh, make the robust uh, what do you call it outbreaks yeah of the of the virus then it is interesting 
not only from the like the animals to human but now human and human but there's still a non-human species there that are that being affected by the human to human transmission but to what extent actually people understand about that now uh, I'm interested actually to under, to see uh, as an anthropologist, for example, to understand what is missing, what new elements they learn, for example, from like uh, 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 Vosita uh, talked about instruction, recommendation, threats, news, etc. that coming, bombing into the people's head, but to what extent actually it's it's helped the people to understand better about the human to human transmission but make the virus it is uh, outbreaks without i mean any ability to control or uh, beyond their ability to control so the relationship between uh, how the instruction the message is coming from so many uh, actors external resources and then how it affect to their understanding and whether to what extent it influenced their behavior why for example we see that so many people are just undisciplined so many people cannot cannot follow or can't be obedient because how could uh, what should i do oh it's okay no problem because i could not see so this if this happens then i'm afraid that it will go on go on and go on so it is interesting also to to see actually in particular areas why the spread or the what you call it the numbers increased the graphs is all uh, not going down but in increased although there are so many instruction recommendation etc so there are some missing links here that needs to be studied more intensively, I think, by anthropologists. So what do you think about this? Thank you. Yeah, Ibuinita, I, I love this question um, because one of the things I've been very interested in with COVID, also with H5N1, but especially with COVID, is the idea of conspiracy and how important uh, conspiracy and what, fake news and, uh, you know, uh, just, um, uh, information that's coming in at different, uh, you know, appealing to different communities. So the community comes before the, the data um, or the community determines the kind of information that is uh, being uh, spread. And that's not really uh, anything unusual. An anthropologist should expect that. Uh, we shouldn't expect that the natural science, whatever that is, or whoever gets to speak for that will, will prevail. Um, but, uh, uh, you, you know, I, one of the things I've been interested in in the United States is how close the left, the right wing conspiratorial narratives are to the left-wing conspiratorial uh, uh, discourses and it's almost completing a, a circle where you can't distinguish between uh, conservative and, and progressive be on, on this uh, issue of conspiracy because uh, it's, the, it's, it's nearly identical. Um, probably different in some important ways but um, also similar in some important ways. Uh, um, you know, so, uh, I mean, some people undoubtedly are learning about, uh, viruses and viral transmission, um, in, in a biomedical way for the first time. Um, uh, and other people, I mean, I come from a, a crazy country where the, the president of my own country is the one who's saying not to wear a mask and uh, the virus is about to be extinguished and will be gone by the fall. Um, you know, so, so that's, pretty, that's pretty intense to, uh, to um, uh, you know, um, but the thing is that pandemics across history have never been about uh, the biology of the virus. Um, they've always had, they've always been social. How do people socially respond to an outbreak? 
Um, and so I think that's what, um, you know, I don't know whether this is quite getting at your question, but it really sparked this, um, this issue of now with uh, uh, computers and social media and the, the rapidity of uh, uh, um, communications um, and the popular control of communications, which um, is, a, is a good thing, um, how easy it is to, uh, for anyone to speculate for any reason and to any ends or means um, about what is happening uh, in, uh, in a question where um, uh, that disregards expertise, right? And not to say that all expertise is one uniform thing, um, but uh, you know, expertise, you always have to balance out um, the, the various forms and modalities of, of expertise, who's saying what? Uh, experts disagree, right? We know that as uh, academics or scientists, right? We know that we don't all agree. That doesn't mean that our expertise is worthless. Um, so how uh, information is transmitted, uh, how, uh, what motivates uh, in various statements about the virus. I think a previous questioner asked about that. Um, you know, these are all things that have become all the more interesting with COVID-19. Um, and I'm sure there are various conspiracies going along going around in Indonesia just the way there are in the United States. Um, uh, so if there's a part of your question I didn't really get to uh, about communicating about the virus and how it spreads between people, um, you know, that's, we're just, uh, we're just lucky that it's not as harmful to children, right? I think. Bagaimana Bu Yunita? Ya. Yeah. Ya, yeah, oke, okay. thank you very okay. much. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Baik, terima kasih Bu Yunita. Uh, yeah. Mari saya cek lagi apakah ada yang ingin uh, bertanya lagi dari Bapak-bapak, Ibu-ibu audiens. Uh, sangat menarik sekali memang tadi perbincangan kita dengan dengan Celia dan dan saya sendiri secara pribadi juga uh, mendapat banyak banyak uh, insight yang yang barangkali sangat uh, penting untuk kita uh, follow up dalam bentuk konkret research dan dan saya pikir uh, ini juga teman-teman bapak-bapak ibu-ibu juga memperoleh hal yang uh, masukan yang sama ya. Uh, dari diskusi kita. Nah, eh, sekali lagi saya eh, buka satu pertanyaan terakhir kalau masih ada memang. Baik, kalau sudah tidak ada dan karena waktunya memang sudah eh, sampai eh, akhir eh, perbincangan kita, dan saya tidak akan summarize karena ini uh, karena sifatnya memang perbincangan jadi uh, kita tidak tidak perlu menghasilkan sesuatu uh, apa namanya agreement atau apapun tetapi sekali lagi seperti saya sudah sampaikan tadi mudah-mudahan ini uh, menjadi semacam uh, uh, masukan buat bapak-bapak ibu-ibu teman-teman untuk untuk uh, berpikir lebih lanjut uh, tentang Bagaimana sebenarnya kalau kita dari ilmu sosial ini uh, ingin meneliti atau ingin ingin memahami lebih jauh lagi tentang virus. Jadi mungkin salah satu poin yang yang saya ingin highlight juga bahwa uh, sebuah pendekatan yang yang dikemukakan atau diuraikan oleh Celia tadi uh, menjadi penting karena di situ uh, kita bisa melihat bahwa sebuah persoalan yang yang sifatnya kompleks sekali. Jadi virus itu bukan hanya persoalan uh, epidemiologi, tapi juga persoalan yang sifatnya sosial. Di situ ada elemen uh, legal, ada elemen uh, politics, ada elemen sejarah juga. Dan semuanya ini saling berkelindan membentuk sebuah assemblage. Dan, dan 
di mana asam lemak itu kemudian attach itu menjadi satu persoalan yang yang barangkali harus kita definisikan sebagai sebuah problem uh, research. Jadi uh, uh, dari saya saya rasa itu saja karena ini uh, banyak sekali yang kita diskusikan dari uh, pagi tadi sampai sekarang sehingga agak uh, sulit untuk me me menjadikan rangkuman. Tetapi uh, sekali lagi bahwa uh, yang sangat saya garis bawahi juga bahwa persoalan uh, uh, etnografik atau viral etnografi ini sendiri uh, tidak hanya persoalan bagaimana tentang virus, tetapi juga bagaimana tentang persoalan yang terkait dengan dengan uh, care, uh, love, dan juga yang paling penting adalah social justice. Dan ini uh, saya pikir uh, antropologi maupun ilmu sosial punya punya posisi yang sangat uh, strategis untuk untuk uh, mengeksplorasi ini lebih lanjut. Uh, baik, terakhir saya berikan kesempatan pada Celia. Barangkali ada sesuatu yang ingin disampaikan. Silakan Celia untuk penutup. No, I just want to say thank you to everyone who took their time uh, this morning in Indonesia and uh, elsewhere to um, come and listen. Uh, it's really an honor for me to get to uh, hear your questions, uh, speak a little bit about my own work, and for uh, in thank you sponsor this opportunity and this really wonderful series of various studies. Um, which um, I'm never following what I'm aware of. So thank you, everyone. And uh, yeah, I hope I can have more opportunities to speak in, in the future with all of you. Baik, saya lihat. Terima kasih. Uh, audionya uh, putus-putus tadi. Dan sekarang tadi freeze, dan sekarang sudah ke lancar kembali. <laughs> Ternyata di Amerika juga sama seperti di Indonesia. Ya. Insinia, terima kasih. <laughs> Baik, saya juga uh, terima kasih atas nama pusat penelitian kewilayahan uh, atas kesediaan Celia untuk menjadi tamu di area scape pagi hari ini dan mudah-mudahan kita nanti bisa bertemu lagi uh, barangkali kolaborasi dalam riset atau uh, penulisan uh, artikel atau apalah gitu dan terima kasih banyak. Dan untuk uh, diskusi ini kami akan rekam dan kami sudah rekam dan kami akan uh, upload di YouTube uh, kewilayahan LIPI. Jadi kalau Bapak Ibu ingin uh, menyebar luaskan di hasil diskusi ini, memanfaatkannya sebagai bahan kuliah atau apa saja silahkan bisa diakses di uh, YouTube channel Pusat Penelitian Kewilayahan LIPI. Dan untuk uh, minggu ini uh, kita terutama kita ternyata sangat sibuk. Besok akan ada area escape lagi untuk yang volume ke enam uh, akan kita akan mendapat uh, menghadirkan tamu dari Cina, uh, Profesor Su Liping yang kemudian akan hostnya uh, bukan saya tetapi uh, Profesor Yakti Maunati yang akan berbicara tentang hubungan antara Cina dan Asia Tenggara. Besok ke hari Kamis jam 1 siang, informasi lebih lanjut tentang meeting ID dan dan password bisa dilihat di Instagram ataupun Facebook dari kewilayahan LIPI. Jadi sekali lagi saya ucapkan terima kasih pada Bapak-Bapak, Ibu-Ibu semua atas kesediaannya berpartisipasi dalam area escape dan untuk area escape selanjutnya silakan dipantengin uh, uh, Facebook kami dan juga uh, Instagram kami baik Instagram atau Facebook uh, pusat penelitian kewilayahan LIPI ataupun Instagram dan Facebook saya pribadi jadi uh, sekali lagi terima kasih atas kehadirannya pada pagi ini dan uh, salam sejahtera dan Sehat selalu, bapak-bapak, ibu-ibu, kawan-kawan semua. <tuh>